I was a little surprised that Stanley Kubrick was doing a science fiction film. It just was a film made by somebody who uh, is tuned into a radio station that I can't get. I can't say I've seen any movie that has been made better. Homer tells us that an odyssey is a round trip. And that was the underlying plan of Stanley Kubrick's 2001, a film shot in virtual secrecy, so that no one would find out how Mr. Kubrick conducted his space odyssey all the way to the far reaches of the solar system, and then back again. I'll never forget the first day I arrived and looked at those sets. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It was like a World's Fair. I can tell you very truthfully that it was difficult to know exactly what we were going to do. Kubrick was determined to make a movie about man's first contact with an advanced world after reading Arthur C. Clarke's short story, The Sentinel. 2001 took more than four years to produce. It was released in 1968, and we've been trying to figure it out ever since. I feel it's sort of uh, about birth and rebirth, uh, death and rebirth. Um, from the Eastern philosophies? I think simply the possibility that there are other forces in the universe. 2001 is not a plot, really. The dialogue is completely unimportant. It's the experience of feeling like for two hours you're in space and something quite amazing and awesome is happening. The Jupiter voyage was certainly eye-opening for 2001's astronauts, but it was a talking, rather arrogant computer named HAL 9000 that stole the scenes. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made, foolproof and incapable of error. We treated Hal like he was a character. I mean, he was there every day, and we spoke to him and interchanged and interfaced with him. Good evening, Dave. How you doing, Hal? Everything's running smoothly. And you? Oh, not too bad. Behind Hal's velvet voice was a computer with emotional problems. I know I've never completely freed myself of the suspicion that there are some extremely odd things about this mission. Hal's circuits eventually go haywire, killing Poole and leaving Bowman stranded outside the ship. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. After fighting his way back in, Bowman gives Hal a lobotomy and begins his mind-boggling trip past floating monoliths into the unknown. Or so it seems. Maybe Arthur C. Clarke can explain. A mere human such as I can't possibly describe what a superhuman intelligence is doing. One can only sort of hint at that by indirection, and that I hope I've done. Clarke has taken the story a quantum leap forward in 2010, Odyssey 2. The book is currently being turned into a movie by writer-director Peter Hyams, who faces the unenviable task of shooting a sequel to the most controversial science fiction movie of all time and following in Stanley Kubrick's footsteps. My thoughts are absolute frozen sheer terror. I think you can only be compared unfavorably. I understand that. I think you have to be arrogant beyond description to think that it would be otherwise. Peter Himes, who's, who's making the film, is a very different kind of director. And uh, I've met with him about the possibility of playing the role. The character I play does appear, but if you read the book, he's in disembodied spirit, so I don't know exactly what they're going to do with the character. So we're still in discussion about that. But will 2010 shed some light at long last on whatever it was we saw in 2001? All those questions are answered, but at the same time, quite a few new ones are posed. Mm -hmm.